Washington, D.C. is the capital city of the United States of America. But very uniquely within the U.S., the territory making up the city of D.C. isn't a part of any of the 50 American states. Instead, the 64 square miles of territory that makes up Washington, D.C.'s area is classified as a federal district under the direct control of the United States Congress. And that fact leads to a lot of strange consequences. All the citizens of every state in the Union are given the right of representation in the U.S. Congress by electing a number of representatives to the House based on that state's population and exactly two senators to the Senate. But since Washington, D.C. isn't a part of any state, and nor is it its own state, the 714,000 or so stateless U.S. citizens who live within it have no ability to elect their own representatives or senators to Congress. And thus, they have no representation or any say in the way that Congress operates. And this is really important, because Congress is the body of government that creates and passes new laws, and sets taxes across the country, including within the confines of D.C., meaning that D.C. residents pay federal taxes just like any citizen from any state, but they get no vote or representation on how their taxes are set and spent, a fact that doesn't go unnoticed by Washington, D.C.'s official license plates. As of the the 2019 fiscal year, the residents of D.C. pay more in overall federal income tax than the residents of 21 actual U.S. states, and on a per capita basis, D.C. residents pay more in federal taxes than the residents of any other state in the Union. And unlike the residents of all those other states that pay less, they don't get any representation in Congress at all, the body that sets their tax rates. Understandably, there's a fierce fight going on right now within D.C. to finally gain their voice and representation in Congress through becoming America's newest and 51st state, which would finally ensure them their representatives and senators. 86% of D.C. voters approved the district's push towards statehood back in 2016, and the current president, Joe Biden, has voiced his support for the movement as well. But the push for D.C. statehood and representation has been going on for well over one and a half centuries now. And despite the overwhelming support for statehood within D.C. itself, there is still a ferocious level of opposition against it across the rest of the United States, making the cause for D.C. statehood one of the most contentious and divisive of all modern American political subjects. And in order to understand how we even got to this absurd situation in the first place, you've got to understand a bit about how it all began more than 200 years ago. Shortly after the American Revolution, the United States was really more of a loose alliance of various different states with various different interests and ideologies. America's founders decided at that time that it would be best to keep the new country's capital and seat of power out of the control of any one state in order to prevent power from being concentrated within any one state's perceived rival. The seat of government and power was to be jointly shared by all of America's states as equals. Therefore, it was written into the Constitution that the seat of federal government would be placed within a federally controlled district outside the jurisdiction of any state, and it was not to exceed 10 miles square in area, or in other words, a square with four 10-mile sides, or 100 square miles in overall area. But the precise location of where this district was supposed to be placed was never specified, nor was any minimum size for it specified. In 1790, George Washington himself decided the district's location would be between the states of Virginia and Maryland along the Potomac River, and the maximum size of 10 miles square would be chosen as well. Thus, Virginia donated some of their land to make up the southern half of the district, while Maryland donated some of their land to make up the northern half of it. This is the 10-mile square that became the Federal District of Washington, D.C., directly governed and ruled by the United States Congress. But of course, people actually lived on that land that was donated by Virginia and Maryland to form it. And those people suddenly now found themselves stateless without any ability to vote for representatives in the Congress that now governed over them. And without any ability to even vote for the president either, since that was also something that only the residents of the states could do. And since Congress ruled the district, Congress appointed D.C.'s mayor and city council, all without the ability of the D.C. residents to even vote for them. Now obviously, this unequal arrangement has been, let's say, unpopular among the stateless and voteless residents of D.C. for well over 200 years now, and it's been a gradual, centuries-long process now to fix it. 
By 1846, the white residents of D.C. and the formerly Virginian half were upset at their lack of representation because they were worried that the abolitionists in Congress, who they couldn't vote for, were going to outlaw slavery within the district and take away their slaves. So, in order to get around it, they begged Virginia to take back the land that they had previously donated to form D.C., and in 1846, Congress agreed and returned it all back to them. The newly made white citizens of Virginia then had representation to vote for Virginia's representatives and senators in Congress and vote for president. And they did it all simply to maintain the status of slavery. And at the same time, this was the decision that formed the modern boundaries of D.C. that we know of today at about 64 square miles of area, down from the previous hundred. But back then, the issue of people living within D.C. not having any representation wasn't the massive deal that it is today because D.C.'s population was still fairly small. Less than 50,000 people lived there back in the 1850s, which was significantly less people than any state at the time. But then, fast forward through a century of unprecedentedly rapid historical changes across the American Civil War, industrialization, Jim Crow, the two world wars, and the Civil Rights era, you would see that DC's population exploded more than 15 times, to the point of there being more than 750,000 residents by the 1960s. Which was by that point, more than these 11 actual US states, and nearing half a percentage point of the entire American population. And yet, despite all of that rapid change in population over the past century, nothing at all had been done to fix any of the issues of D.C. residents' representation and ability to vote in government. And by the time of the American Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s, this fact began gaining particular attention due to the fact that the majority of D.C.'s population were by this point African Americans. At 54% of D.C.'s population in 1960, that was more than 400,000 people of color within the district who weren't allowed to govern themselves, still could not vote for the president, and who still had zero representation of any kind in America's government. But the winds of change were finally beginning to blow. In 1961, Congress successfully passed and ratified the 23rd Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which sort of worked out a partial solution to the overall problem. The amendment granted all the residents of D.C. the ability to finally vote for the president as if they were an actual state. You see, American presidential elections are based around the concept of the Electoral College, in which every state in the Union appoints a number of electors with one vote each based on the size of their state's delegation to Congress. Or in other words, based on their numbers of representatives in the House and senators in the Senate. This means that regardless of population, every state in the Union is guaranteed at least three electors that they can send to the Electoral College to vote for the president. Because every state is guaranteed exactly two senators regardless of population, and has a base of one representative in the House with further representatives assigned based on population. The 23rd Amendment essentially means that during presidential elections, the Electoral College will pretend that D.C. is a state and grant them a number of electors equal to the number of the smallest real state in the Union, which is pretty much always going to be Wyoming. Since Wyoming's two senators and one representative grants them three electors in the college, that means that D.C. also gets three electors as if they also had two senators and one representative, which they really don't, but at any rate, this meant that the very first presidential election that D.C. residents were actually allowed to vote in was the 1964 election between Lyndon Baines Johnson and Barry Goldwater, the very same year that the Beatles first hit the number one spot on U.S. singles. But while the 23rd Amendment solved the issue of D.C.'s representation and voice in presidential elections, it did nothing for their representation in Congress, nor their own self-governance independent of Congress. So a few years later on in 1970, Congress passed a small half-measure for them, the District of Columbia Delegate Act. This act finally enabled D.C. residents to elect one representative to the House. But it wasn't a real representative. D.C.'s representative would be classified as a non-voting delegate, meaning they could sit and observe within the House, introduce legislation, and speak on the floor. But they were in reality powerless because they weren't allowed to actually vote on anything. And this situation of the non-voting delegate to the House still exists today. Finally, in 1973, Congress passed the District of Columbia Home Rule Act, 
Up until then, Congress had appointed DC City Council and Mayor without any elections or input from the local DC residents. This reform finally changed all of that and finally allowed the residents of DC themselves to elect their own City Council and Mayor, culminating with the election of Walter Washington in 1975, the first African American to ever become the mayor of a major US city. But Congress still retained oversight over the DC City budget and final say over the district's local law while the president still directly controlled the DC National Guard. So they still weren't truly self-governed, and they still didn't have any say in the election of actual members to Congress. So, a few years later in 1978, another constitutional amendment was proposed in Congress that would have solved that had it actually been ratified. This new amendment, just like the 23rd Amendment that preceded it, would continue pretending that DC was a state for the purposes of presidential elections, but it would also go another step further by pretending that DC was a state for congressional representation as well. Under it, DC would be granted one full representative in the House who could actually vote, and two full senators in the Senate, without actually being classified as a state. This proposed amendment passed with the required two-thirds majority in both the House and the Senate, but as with all other amendments to the Constitution, it then needed to be ratified by a three-fourths majority of the 50 U.S. state legislatures. Or, in other words, a minimum of 38 of the U.S. states had to approve it. The states were all given seven years to make up their mind, and after those seven years were up, only 16 of them had voted in favor, and the amendment was short by 22. And thus, the amendment failed and DC's hundreds of thousands of residents still had no representation in Congress. Outraged at the results, a new movement was born within DC that became seen as the only way to guarantee their own congressional representation forever. Become America's 51st state. In 1982, DC voters approved and ratified a newly proposed state constitution under the working name of New Columbia, and approved a shadow delegation that they would elect of two shadow senators and one shadow representative who would continuously lobby Congress for DC statehood. Because, as with all other states, their application would have to be approved by Congress first. Finally, in November of 1993, an actual bill on the statehood of Washington, D.C. made its way to Congress to vote on for the very first time in history. Beginning within the House of Representatives, the bill would need to be passed by a simple majority of the 435 representatives before then moving on to the Senate, where it would also be required to pass with another simple majority of the 100 senators. From there, it would pass on to the president to sign the resolution into law, and the new state would be welcomed into the Union a process that is notably significantly easier than passing a constitutional amendment where three-fourths of the state legislatures need to voice their approval. But the 1993 bill failed on the first step in the House decisively, with 277 representatives voting no and only 153 voting yes, despite the then-President Bill Clinton voicing his own personal support as the first sitting president to ever publicly approve of DC statehood. But the reason why the 1993 vote failed becomes a lot clearer when you reveal the political affiliations of the votes behind it. Of the 277 no votes, 172 were Republicans, which were all of the Republicans in the House save for one, while another 105 were Democrats. And that meant that of the 153 yes votes, 151 were Democrats, one was from Bernie Sanders as an independent, and only one was from a Republican. Republicans almost universally rejected DC statehood, while Democrats at the time were fairly split over it. But why? Well, because if Washington DC ever actually becomes a state, it would be a very, very solidly democratic one. Like most urban areas in the United States, Washington DC leans heavily progressive and democrat in political terms. But it leans very heavily democrat compared to other states. DC voters have not elected a single Republican to their city council in more than 13 years now since 2009. And ever since they've been able to vote for president back in 1964, they have never once voted for a Republican candidate. And ever since John Kerry's candidacy in 2004, DC voters have voted overwhelmingly in favor between 89% and 92% for the Democratic candidate for president, including most recently with Joe Biden, who secured 92% of DC's vote in 2020. 
Washington, D.C. is a solid political stronghold for the Democratic Party, and were it to ever become a fully-fledged state, it would effectively mean a permanent new set of two Democratic senators to the Senate out of only 102, and permanently alter the balance of political power between the two most major of America's parties. That is obviously a huge political reason for Democrats across America to support D.C. becoming a state and Republicans across America to oppose it. Hence, the highly partisan nature of the statehood vote in the House of 1993 and in the nature of the discourse around D.C. statehood ever since. But defeat in 1993 would not be the end of D.C.'s residents' attempt to gain statehood and final representation in Congress. Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and Joe Biden have all publicly supported D.C.'s efforts to become a state ever since. While George W. Bush denounced it, and Donald Trump maintained an official stance of neutrality, though promising to veto it if it ever came to his desk. More than 150 constitutional amendments and bills have been introduced since the 19th century to provide representation for D.C.'s residents with more than 20 congressional hearings on it with hardly anything ever really being done about it. But finally, in 2016, more than two decades after defeat in 1993, the movement to transform DC into America's 51st state began gaining momentum again. In November of that year, DC residents voted overwhelmingly in favor of becoming the newest state with 86% support. This new statehood proposal would transform the current mayor into the new governor, and the current city council into the new state legislature, while naming the new state, State of Washington, D.C., with the D.C. part now standing for Douglas Commonwealth. In honor of the famed abolitionist and writer Frederick Douglass, who used to live in the district for decades until his death back in 1895. If successful, the new proposal would transform the majority of the current district into the new state of D.C., while leaving a new, significantly smaller, federally controlled district as an enclave, covering just the National Mall, the White House, the Capitol Building, the Supreme Court Building, and the principal federal buildings, museums, and monuments that are immediately adjacent. The state of D.C. would become America's first city-state, and by far the smallest in area. But it would not be the smallest in population, nor in economy. D.C. would have more residents than the states of Wyoming and Vermont, and have a roughly equivalent number of residents as Alaska. Simultaneously, the D.C. state economy would be larger than any of the next 17 states, including pretty large states like Nebraska and Arkansas. And it would also become the state with the highest proportion of African Americans as residents, currently at about 41% of the overall population, making up a slight majority. And, of course, the flag of the United States would have to be changed to reflect the newest 51st star, which could potentially end up looking something like this. And of course, as a state with the 49th highest population, the residents of D.C. would finally, after centuries, gain the right to elect their one full representative to the House and two full senators to the Senate, changing the numbers of representatives to 436 and the numbers of senators to 102. On the 26th of June, 2020, this new bill for D.C. statehood finally made its way to a vote in the House of Representatives for the second time in history after 1993. And unlike that last time, it actually passed through the House this time, with 232 yes votes to 180 no votes. Every single one of the 178 House Republicans voted no, alongside just one Democrat and one Libertarian while conversely, every single other House Democrat voted yes. But even though the bill passed through the House, it then had to go through the Senate, which was at the time majority controlled by the Republicans, while President Trump, also a Republican, vowed to veto the bill were it to somehow pass through the Senate and arrive on his desk. Naturally, the bill died in the Republican-controlled Senate with Democrats and Republicans alike making their cases on supporting or opposing D.C. statehood. Some Republicans began advocating for a sort of political compromise based around the idea of Maryland taking back control over the land it had donated to form D.C. more than two centuries previously. The argument went that since Congress had previously returned the land Virginia had donated to form D.C. back in 1846, the current Congress could also return the land that Maryland had donated while retaining the tiny federal district proposed by the statehood bill. In doing so, the 714,000 residents of D.C. would all become residents of Maryland, 
granting them the right to vote on Maryland's two already existing senators alongside the other 6 million Maryland residents. And boosting Maryland's population up to around 6.7 million people. Which would almost certainly grant Maryland an additional representative in the House that would naturally be assigned to the new former residents of D.C. Thus, their argument was that D.C. residents would gain congressional representation and self-rule through Maryland. But the argument doesn't consider that the overwhelming majority of D.C. residents don't want to become a part of Maryland. They want to be their own state. And at the same time, the Maryland legislature itself has repeatedly expressed that they have no desire to reclaim any of their previous land. A public policy poll conducted back in 2016 found that only 28% of Marylanders favored annexing D.C. And a later 2019 Washington Post poll found that 57% of Marylanders opposed annexing D.C. full stop. But there's another, much weirder consequence that could also end up happening if Maryland just took back most of D.C. If they did, and Congress didn't also repeal the 23rd Amendment, then that amendment's rules would still apply to the tiny federal district still remaining around the National Mall. And that means that for the purposes of presidential elections, the tiny district remaining would still be treated as a full state and be able to appoint three electors to the Electoral College. Under this circumstance, the only people who might actually be living within the district would be the president themselves and their immediate family and aides within the White House. Meaning that effectively, the sitting president themselves would become capable of personally appointing three electors to the Electoral College out of the 538 total electors. Meaning that the president would be effectively capable of casting half a percentage point of the entire national vote for president and have enough personal voting power as the entirety of the state of Delaware with more than one million people. This would obviously grant the president an absurd amount of power in voting on their own re-election or the election of their intended successor. And getting rid of that power would be very challenging because the only way to remove an amendment from the Constitution like the 23rd would be with another amendment. And that means that it would have to pass with a two-thirds majority in both the House and the Senate and then be approved by three-fourths of the states. And to date, this process has proven so challenging to overcome that only one single amendment to the Constitution has ever been successfully repealed. The 18th Amendment that outlawed alcohol and established prohibition, which was later repealed by the 21st Amendment. However, this potential problem of increasing the president's power like this isn't just unique to Maryland annexing D.C. Conversely, were D.C. to become the 51st state instead, the very same problem would also still exist within the tiny federal district that remained. In order to overcome this, the D.C. statehood bill specifically includes fast-tracking the process to repeal the 23rd Amendment after D.C. becomes a state. But, once again, that's really easier said than done. Would two-thirds of the House and the Senate and three-fourths of the states actually agree to remove the president's power to cast roughly a million votes in their own election? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that this issue hasn't stopped D.C. from continuing their quest towards statehood. Despite their second failure in 2020, pretty much the same bill for D.C. statehood found its way into the House for the third time the following year in 2021. Emboldened by the replacement of Republican Trump with Democrat Biden in the White House, and with the Democrats gaining a razor-thin majority in the Senate, split roughly 50-50, with Democratic Vice President Kamala Harris wielding the all-important tie-breaking vote. This meant that if the D.C. statehood bill passed through the House and made it to the Senate floor for a vote, it would almost certainly be narrowly voted through and sent on to President Biden to sign in a law. So on the 22nd of April 2021, the House once again passed the D.C. statehood bill by a narrow majority of 216 yes to 208 no pretty much expectedly entirely along partisan lines, 
with Democrats overwhelmingly voting yes and Republicans overwhelmingly voting no. But it's still not likely to pass through the Senate, even with the Democrats' slight majority there, because of the filibuster. When a bill is filibustered in the Senate, it needs to be approved by 60 of the 100 sitting senators in order to advance towards the floor for a vote. And since 50 of the current senators are Republicans, that would require at least 10 of the Republican senators to allow it to come to a vote, which isn't likely to happen right now. And that, in a nutshell, is the whole story of DC's two-century-long quest for representation in Congress so far. How to solve the problem of finally granting congressional representation to the 714,000 residents of Washington, D.C. is one of the most pressing political problems facing the United States in the 21st century. In truth, though, this problem is only one of many, of all different kinds, facing humanity at large this century. All around the world, there's almost no shortage of different major problems facing us. And we really need more people working towards solving them and making it all a better place including you, and 80,000 Hours can help. They're a truly incredible organization, and unlike most of my sponsors in the past, they're not asking you to buy anything. They're just asking if you want to help change the world. 80,000 Hours is a nonprofit completely funded through philanthropic donations, and they help people find fulfilling careers that also do good for the world. Based on more than 10 years of research alongside academics from Oxford University, their goal is to help you find a job that'll make a positive difference in the world, help solve some of the biggest problems facing us in the 21st century, and also gives you job satisfaction. So whether you're just starting out with your career after college, or you're looking to make a big change in your direction mid-career, or you're wanting to address pressing global problems from your current job, 80,000 Hours can help. They have a brilliant website where they freely share all of their research, through insanely in-depth guides on how to find the perfect career for you. A whole page of cold email templates that you can use the next time you apply, a podcast, a newsletter, and they even have a job board with hundreds of open listings that, based on their years of research, they believe are the best jobs to make the world better for now and deep into the future. And best of all, this is all completely free for you to use forever. So, if you're not sure what you want to do with yourself right now or with your job in the 80,000 hours that you'll have available across your working career, you can click the button that's here on screen now or follow the link down below in the description and 80,000 hours will send you a completely free copy of their in-depth career guide that'll hopefully enable you to make the right decision for yourself and help change the world in the process. And as always, thank you so much for watching.